Okay, we'll uh, pray and get started. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this privilege of calling you, our Father. We thank you for this privilege, Lord, that we can come, we can draw near to you, Father God. We thank you that uh, you're always uh, available for each and every one of us, Father God. You're never busy, always available, Lord. Thank you. We thank you, Lord, that your ears are always open to our cries. Father, we thank you that you never sleep nor slumber, God. Master, we thank you that you are mindful of us. And so, Lord, this morning, Lord, we turn in awe of you. Um, Lord, we turn our gaze upon you, turn our focus on you. And Lord, we um, we just say, God, that um, Lord, you are awesome, you are wonderful. Lord, you are beautiful, God. And uh, Lord, worthy of all the worship worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the honor. And um, yes, Lord, we are you're so Lord, a privileged, Lord, to, to be able to call you our Father, to draw near to you. And we thank you that you've made a way for us to come to your throne, to come to your throne room, God. And uh, we thank you that we can receive grace and mercy Lord, every time we come. Lord, we, we just pray right now that you would pour out your grace and mercy upon us, Lord. Lord, pour out your grace upon us, Lord. Yes, Father God, that we may grow in the grace of God. Father, we pray that, uh, that we may be strong in your grace. Yes, Lord. That we may have a Lord's deep understanding, a firm and firm understanding of your grace. And also, Lord, we, we ask that, um, that we would be empowered by your grace, enabled by your grace, Lord, to do the things that you've called us to do, Father God. We thank you. We thank you, Master. Your grace enables us. You know, let's just thank the Lord for the grace of God. His grace enables us, meaning empowers us to do what he's called us to do. So we can be greatly encouraged because His grace is available for us today. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God, the love of God, everything that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives, brings into our spirit. So uh, let's just thank the Lord and receive what He is pouring into our hearts, pouring into our lives. Oh, we bless your name, Lord. We thank you for the strength. We thank you for the refreshing. God, we thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord and continuing to do in our lives. We thank you. We come at this time, we come at this day into your mighty hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so First Corinthians, we are almost nearing the end, right? Or maybe we are halfway there. Huh? Three, four, six, 16 chapters. So we are in chapter, uh, we finished halfway through right we have finished chapter 9 um, and we are getting into chapter 10 so uh, you know very interesting chapter 8 we uh, studied about uh, in the last session we looked at uh, what paul talks about uh, you know food offered to idols and then chapter 9 he's giving evidence for his apost apostleship in response to uh, the questions are uh, in response to the kind of a attitude that uh, the Corinthian church or people or you know a few individuals if not all um, the kind of uh, thing they had about Paul um, and uh, in response to that he gives uh, some evidences of his apostleship and we see that all the evidence or the things that he is uh, the reasons that he's placing before them is actually about service about servanthood about uh, sacrifice greater sacrifice uh, for the cause of christ and uh, you know so uh, which is which is really amazing he's saying this is what i do as an apostle this is what i do as an apostle you know um, and i have the necessity or woe unto me if i do not uh, preach the gospel right so he is is um, uh, and and then he says, you know, I become all things to all men, right? to the Jew, to the Gentile, to the ones without the law, but yet not without law unto Christ, right? Which means that uh, you know I walk in uh, in purity and holiness, and uh, and as laid out 
by God, as the Lord would lead me. I, you know, not in sin, not in uh, rebellion or anything, but you know, as the Lord leads me and uh, with Lord towards God. But uh, I become relevant to all men, and uh, so we we saw all that in the last class. Right? So today we look at uh, chapter ten. And we'll see, um, you know, what he is uh, talking about. Uh, again, like you know, what um, we refer to, chapter eight and chapter ten, he um, talks about uh, uh, again idolatry and bring comes back to, uh, you know, food offered to idols and uh, and brings a, a complete picture or a complete solution uh, to uh, to what he was referring to. Okay, so um, so let's look at that. Okay, so if you have your notes, uh, we're looking at uh, chapter 10, right? Okay, let's, uh, this is page 80 in your notes, sorry, 81. Okay, so let's um, read through some of the verses, maybe the first 13 verses. Okay, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as some some of them as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23000 fell nor let us tempt christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so um, chapter 10. So before we, um, so th these first 13 verses talk about um, the, the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness out of Egypt, and what all they went through, and he talks about uh, you know at least five things, and he's saying that uh, this is what they did, this is what they did wrong, and uh, and all these five things, you know, whatever has happened, uh, these can be examples for us. These were or these were written, these are recorded for our as examples and for our admonition, for our correction, and. Um, so that we can be careful, you know. He says, you know, therefore, um, let him who think he stands take heed, be careful lest he fall. Okay, and and then he ends that. So let's uh, look at that. So before we go into that, um, uh, you know, when we look at chapter eight, okay, so eight, he um, he talked about uh, idol worship. He talked about uh, the fact that. Uh, an idol is nothing, um, and the food also is nothing. But you avoid, you know, eating. Uh, you know, if somebody sees you eating the food in the temple, you know, if um, if they see you doing that, and and for the sake of the one who is weak, for the sake of the weaker brother, for the sake of the one who is uh, probably new to faith, not mature, uh, for the sake of them, do not eat. And, and he makes that. A statement that you know I do not want to make them st stumble. You know, if my eating, if my action um, will make the brother stumble, then I will never again 
eat meat. Okay, that's what he says, right? So here uh, he's talking about few things before going into the um, the uh, about idol worship. Okay, so he's talking about uh, um, uh, from the from the history from from what happened to the people of his um, children of Israel after in from their exodus from Egypt to the promised land and what happened in the uh, you know in the interim period okay so so the children of Israel they had some amazing experiences like they were led by the pillar of cloud like God actually led them uh, in a pillar of cloud by day and a fire a pillar of fire by night um, and they you know went through the Red Sea just so miraculous and uh, you know as they, they saw the deliverance they they saw uh, miraculous and supernatural as they traveled, they saw water come out of that rock, and where there was no water, and then it quenched their thirst. They, when they were hungry, the um, there was manna which came from heaven, and they 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 ate that, and they were filled, and quails, and um, which the Lord sent them, and so um, you know all this happened, right? So it says uh, in verse four that uh, let's let's actually read. You know, it says. Uh, uh, from the from verse one, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea, meaning you know the uh, the Red Sea, the cloud, uh, the and all were baptized into Moses. So in in a way, they were you know whatever Moses experienced, they all experienced. They all ate the same spiritual and ate and drank the same spiritual drink uh, from the rock that followed them and that rock was christ so you know here's a very um, important revelation okay about the pre-existence of the lord jesus right so uh, about the fact that the lord is um, or uh, the, the the lord was present uh, because john talks about in the beginning was the word right and everything was created through the word so the pre-existence of christ this verse again uh, shows us that and um, uh, and also you know the fact that there were some old testament types old testament uh, you know types and shadows uh, which which point to Christ, which point to the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, so uh, as they traveled, they experienced uh, several things. They experienced the good, they experienced the supernatural, and, and yet um, they went after certain things. Okay, so it says that um, you know, uh, verse six onwards, he gives certain examples. Okay, so let's uh, look at that, and he says, you know, these were. For our examples, you know, it's recorded so that we can learn from them. It's recorded so that we can uh, can be corrected through this. Right? So, what, what the first thing that we see is verse six uh, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay, so um, you know, if you follow in your notes, there's Exodus thirty-two verses one and one to eight. So let's probably look at that. Um, Exodus 32, um, when people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said, come, make us gods and uh, that shall go before us for as uh, for this Moses, the man who brought us out, out of the land of Egypt. We don't know, know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the year. Uh, golden earrings which are in the ears of your wife your sons and your daughters and bring them to me so all the people broke off the golden earrings brought them which are in their ears they brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from their hand he fashioned it with a engraving tool and mailed a more calf um, then they said to him this is your God O Israel that brought you uh, that uh, brought you out of the land of Egypt so when Aaron saw it he built an altar and made a proclamation and said tomorrow is a feast to the Lord then they rose early on the uh, on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You now the very uh, phrase here is what uh, Paul ref refers to in verse seven, right? He says the people uh, uh, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Uh, the things that they were craving, Psalm 105 talks about some of their cravings, and also, you know, verse um, 34, I think, 
you know talks about sorry uh, th this is about the golden calf um if we look at um, uh, uh, and uh, this is the second point i'm sorry i was just referring to the second point idolatry so idolatry is is one of the things we see that something that is replacing god in their lives we see that they they make and then they go after it and uh, they worship it in a moment in an instant they they forget they forget who their god is who brought them out of egypt they forget and it happened at a time when there was a delay uh, in hearing from god you know like uh, as we read now some uh, sorry um, uh, verses 1 to 8 we see that moses delayed coming down from the mountain okay so there was a delay in hearing from god moses had gone saying okay um, uh, to receive from god to hear from god that he would come and instruct the people uh, uh, further instructions what they need to do and and, and so on but he comes down and um, when people saw that there was a delay, then they decide to create a substitute for God. You know, when so um, so th there's a lesson for us as well. You know, in seasons when we don't hear, in times when we don't hear clearly, or when, when there's no instruction, you know, we don't make an idol of something, okay, and create something, and uh, in place of God, in place of His instruction. Right. There's a lesson for us, um, and um, so uh, that's the about idolatry. Okay. Um, then also the lust for other things. You know, verse six talks about how they lusted after, and Numbers eleven talks that they 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 said uh, they complain and they and they are craving for you know for meat. Okay, and they said you know in Egypt, in the place where they were slaves, where they were in bondage. Uh, they said, you know, we had fish, we had all these wonderful vegetables uh, to eat, and here in the wilderness, we don't have any meat. Okay, the fact is that they were being fed; they had enough. It's not like they were starving, but in despite God's provision, they were craving, they were lusting after, and uh, uh, and they were reminded of the things that they. Uh, they were, you know, they had when they were in bondage, right? And they lusted after that. So, so the thing is, there's, you know, nothing wrong with fish, nothing wrong with, uh, you know, the the vegetables and everything. But the fact is that they were craving, that they were, um, you know, lusting after it uh, in a uh, in in a manner that was not normal, right? And complaining and so on. So the lusting after evil things, um, Paul writes, verse six, verse eight. Um, we see, um, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. So he's referring to sexual immorality, and uh, and and again a, a warning here. You know, like he warns in chapter nine, in right, the previous chapter, says flee sexual immorality. Right, it was twenty. Um, uh, and he and he talk, uh, and he also talks about how he brings his life uh, under subjection. He brings his life um, uh, under. Uh, uh, he disciplines his body. He, he brings it, lest he, after preaching that he himself should become disqualified. So he 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 brings his life. He disciplines himself, right? And um, so the thing is uh, to watch out and not commit or not give in to sexual uh, immorality okay, again a warning the fourth one we see is um, verse 9 where um, yeah verse 9 nor let us tempt christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents okay tempt christ as some of them did so we let's go to exodus 17 and um, Okay, Exodus um, 17 and verses 1 to 7. Okay. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me and why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted 
there for water and the, and the people complained against Moses and said, why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said, go on before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also, take in your hand your rod which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the Lord. Okay, but Moses tells the people, you know, why do you tempt the Lord? Why do you, uh, you know, why do you test him? Why do you tempt him? If you look at verse, um, sorry, chapter 21, okay, Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4. Um, um, let's just go there. Okay. Now, here, Numbers 21 and verse uh, 5, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Um, again, the same thing, like the same thoughts. Right? Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Okay, So whatever God provided for them, saying, you know, our uh, our soul loathes this, you know, we, we are not satisfied with it. With it. Um, and then, uh, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, and for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And then, you know, we know how they made a uh, bronze serpent, and whoever looked at it could, uh, you know, was uh, saved, right? Was um, could live. But the thing is this, that um, when we, you know, it, it, yes, it is true that there will be difficult times. Yes, it's true that, uh, you know, in those difficult times, it's, uh, it's you know, we feel low, we, we don't feel, uh, uh, you know, we, we, there is a, there is a temptation to, to not trust God. There is a temptation to not hold on to the promises right there is a temptation but but in those times uh, we need to remember you know what the lord has done we need to uh, look back at the journey look back at what the lord has done look back at all those testimonies and not really question god you know and we, we, we can definitely ask questions we can ask questions like the psalmist did you know why lord why are these things happening we can definitely reason with him um but the fact is you know we are not uh, not to uh, question or challenge his position as god right you know uh, are you really god you know are you really um you know doing the things that you're saying that that you said that you will do uh, and things like that so so here we see, you know, we are not to tempt or we are not to test uh, God. You know, the Amplified Bible says uh, we are not to, uh, you know, this attempt to tempt Christ as testing his patience, questioning his purpose, and exploiting his goodness. Right? The whatever the people did in complaining and and testing. So they were testing his patience, questioning his purposes and um, also exploiting his goodness because they said you know hey you fed us but then we are we are not happy right you've given us enough and more of this uh, of this food but you know uh, we uh, we don't find it uh, you know we, our soul loathes the taste of it this bread so they call it the worthless bread okay. so uh, so this is what they did right so tempting christ so uh, Paul quotes that, refers to that instance, and he says, well, let us not tempt Christ as some of them did, and because of which they face the consequences of that. So let us not do that. Then verse 10, uh, he talks about the fact that many of them complained, many of them murmured uh, against him. Right. So chapter 10, verse 10. Okay, just... 
nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So when we look at complaining, we're saying, you know, what's wrong in complaining? You know, something is not right. Something is uh, you know, not going according to plan. You know, and I you know, make a big noise about it. Um, but the fact is, you know, just because you know some things are not right around us, you know, let's not complain and murmur uh, about God. Okay, that is the thing, right? The complaining and murmuring about God. What is God doing? I don't know. You know, I wonder why He is, you know, uh, allowing these things uh, on the earth. You know, complaining and murmuring against God. So, um, so. So, so Paul lists these things, these five things. What are those five things again? You know, lust for other things, lust for evil things, idolatry. Secondly, uh, thirdly, you know, uh, sexual immorality or sexual impurity. Fourth, to uh, um, warning about tempting Christ. Um, and the fifth thing is complaining and murmuring. So he's saying, avoid these things. These things were written before for our example and admonition among whom the ends of the ages have come. Okay. So saying, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, be careful. Okay. Um, so if you look at these five verses, these really, these uh, five things um, prevented the people, some of the people from getting into or reaching their destiny. Right? They were destroyed. It, uh, it stopped them, prevented them from reaching their destiny. Okay, so Paul is saying, you know, don't uh, uh, be corrected, right? Don't uh, give in to these things. Uh, let it be an example for us. Okay, then uh, verse um, thirteen: No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will allow you to be temp who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it okay so that word there for temptation it also refers to a testing time or a trial right or uh, you know some difficult time adversity uh, affliction trouble and it could also refer to uh, an inducement to sin right and an invitation, an enticement to sin, right? So uh, based on the context from what he has said, based on the context, we see that it is, uh, you know, uh, either it can be a difficult time, a testing time, or, uh, you know, what we face as an inducement, an invitation to sin, okay? But we know that God doesn't tempt us or test us, but he's saying here that um, God is faithful. When you face those moments, when you face these, you know, either difficulties, adversities, or you know, this temptation because of what's happening around, because of the evil one, right? Or even because of we placing ourselves in that place, right? We making ourselves uh, vulnerable. Uh, says that God is faithful. In what way is he faithful? Right? Firstly, that, that he knows our limits and he also places a way out. Okay, what is the way out of that temptation? What is that way out of that difficult uh, period? So he places solutions, answers, right? He play, in other words, uh, a way out of that. You know, how can I come out of this? And how can I exit this, uh, this situation? And he places that because he is faithful. Okay, it says God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, and that word there, that way of escape, meaning uh, a way out. Or it could also refer to bringing to an end, that way of escape. You know, that that phrase there in 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 the Greek, it means a way out or an exit or an end. Okay, bringing it to a close. 
right? So the thing is that um, you know when when faced with temptation, you know we see that God has placed a way out. We take that exit. We come out of it. Or you know till that ends, you stand firm, like you endure it. Uh, and if it's a difficult time, um, if it's a difficult season, you know, run through the exit, exit or resist till the end. Okay, don't give in. Right. So, um, verse fourteen. Uh, again, he starts to talk about idolatry. Okay, and he talks about. Uh, it, it brings in another aspect of idolatry, which is fellowship, okay, koinonia, about idolatry, idol worship. Now he's talking about, you know, what happens in worship uh, of idols, and because of which, uh, you know, there is uh, there is a fellowship, there is a partnership. So he explains that by comparing that with the uh, the Lord's table, right? Comparing that with communion. Uh, the bread and uh, and the wine that is uh, you know which is representing I'm sorry representing the death burial and resurrection of the Lord representing the cross and what did and what happens when we actually take part in that so he's comparing that with worship of idols okay um, so um, he's saying therefore my beloved brethren flee from idolatry okay so flee from worship of idols free from uh, you know, an, an, an association with, uh, uh, you know, any kind of, any form of idolatry, okay? Verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves. You know, you know, he's appealing to their intellect. So he's saying, you know, I speak as to wise men. You are intelligent people. You understand what I'm saying. So I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves. Verse 16, if the cup of communion which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then, that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to gods, not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the, of the table of demons, or do we Provoke the Lord to jealousy. Are we stronger than He? So He's saying, you know. Therefore, you know, all these things happened. You know, one of the things was um, idol idol worship, right? Because they they were uh, Moses was delayed from coming from the mountain and reaching them. So they made an idol and they said, you know, well, this is the God who led us out of Egypt. So and along with that. Uh, he also, excuse me, he also lists down all these other things, the four other things that blocked their destiny in God and because of which their lives were destroyed. So he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Okay, run away, don't, don't associate, don't get involved. And he's going to explain another aspect of idolatry okay so he's talking about communion okay the cup of blessing he's calling it a cup of blessing you know uh, and uh, so that also gives us um, uh, some insight the fact that when we drink of the cup it is a cup of blessing right what uh, what why is it a cup of blessing because it's referring to the cross and what the lord did for us on the cross and um, you know uh, the thing that we receive because of the cross, the things that we receive because of the cross, forgiveness and deliverance and healing um, that we receive because of the cross, salvation because of the cross. Right? So the blood that was shed, it's uh, the cup that we're drinking, it's represent, 
representing that. It symbolically represents that. And I think the cup that we drink, you know, it's a cup of blessing. You know, you, you speak a blessing. Um, it says, um, you know, the cup of blessing which we bless. Right? You thank the Lord. Uh, you, you acknowledge that all that God has done, all that the Lord has done on the cross, and we, we drink it. Uh, and it's is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So the, you use that word uh, koinonia, okay, communion meaning close fellowship, okay, fellowship, or we are sharing, we are partnering, uh, and coming to that place of oneness. Okay, we are uh, so we are sharing, meaning we are receiving, right? We are receiving the benefits. Uh, we are coming in fellowship with what was done on the cross. So it's a wonderful picture, right? Of what was done on the cross, the blood that was shed uh, on the cross. And we are coming into fellowship. We are sharing or we are receiving uh, the benefits of that, the victory of that. You know, we are receiving into our lives. We are coming into fellowship. Same way with the bread. So he's saying, you know, that that bread that we break, which we break, is it not the communion or the fellowship, the partnership, the sharing of the body of Christ? You know, he he was nailed on the cross, and uh, and what did he carry uh, on the cross, and uh, what happened as a result of that? We are coming to a fellowship, sharing, communion, partnership with that. Okay, so in that. When we take communion, we are actually. This is what is happening. We are. We are actually over and over again. We are proclaiming, declaring, and we are. We are coming in communion. There is something. It is a physical act. It's a simple thing, of eating and drinking. But it has spiritual significance. But there is something. There is something that is happening in the spiritual realm, that is affecting us. You know, in our body, in our minds, in our spirit. Right? We are being edified. Uh, the, the works of the enemy are cancelled, broken, because we are coming in communion with what was done for us on the cross, right? over and over again. So it's a very powerful. Uh, that's why it is powerful. It is not about because these are earthly elements, the bread and the and the grape juice that we you know, use or whatever juice we are using to drink. It is symbolic. But when we proclaim. In faith, when we declare this is what happened on the cross and this is what he carried, then something uh, spiritual, uh, something of great spiritual significance happens, and that is supernatural. That is that is breaking the work of the enemy, uh, cleansing us, and so on. So there is communion that's happening. Okay, so we are actually coming to a place of saying we are one body. We are the body of Christ. We are one body. We are one. Right. That is what you proclaim, right? Saying that part of the body of Christ, and you are thanking the Lord and saying, "Lord, I thank you." That is why we call it communion. We are one in Christ. We are one. Um, you know, we are part of that spiritual body of Christ. We are connected with all believers in this spiritual body, which is what one Corinthians um, twelve talks about. You know, the, whoever believes, he is placed. He is baptized into the body of Christ. You know, spiritually, we are one members of the body of Christ. So that is also something that we are uh, proclaiming. We are uh, attesting. Right? This is what is happening. And uh, so that is one thing, like communion. When we partake, we are, you know, uh, there is fellowship, that oneness, that we have one, one with God, one with God's people in the spirit. The other thing also is saying that, you know, when um, uh, uh, when uh, verse 18, right, it says, um, observe Israel after the flesh, you know, in the natural, when observe, when you observe, when you see uh, what happened, the kind of worship that happened uh, in Israel, that um, the one who partook of the altar, either be the priest in the tabernacle or, you know, uh, the worship or the sacrifice that was made and the one who partakes of the altar are actually um, those who are pa taking part in the worship. One, an act of worship is to take part or eat 
of what is offered at the altar. Right? So that is, uh, you know, that means that you are worshipping, you are coming to a place of, um, you know, acknowledging and worshipping. So it's an act of worship. So he, he talks about that. Verse 18. Okay. Verse 19. What am I saying then? Okay, so all this is there. You're coming to a place of oneness. You're coming to a place of communion. Uh, when we partake of the bread and partake of the uh, or drink from the cup, uh, communion, that's the picture. Even in Israel, you know, Israel, when people offered at the altar, it was an act of worship. So they were you know, uh, they were worshipping, acknowledging, and because of which they would offer on the altar and also partake of what was uh, at the altar as an act of worship. Now, verse 19, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idol is, is anything? Am I saying that it's, you know, idol is something very significant or, you know, that object is significant or uh, the food that is offered is that significant? Right, he's talking about chapter eight, referring again to chapter eight. You know, I've already, you know, he's already shared that that it is not okay. Rather, verse twenty. Now, this is the important thing. Rather that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to spirits, or they sacrifice to demons, the spirits behind, okay, um, and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Okay, the same way when we take part in communion, we actually fellowship with God. We are receiving something from God. There's a spiritual transfer that's happening, spiritual communi communion that's happening, impartation that's happening, even though it's a physical act. So he's saying, you know, it's the same way. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Right? Because when they offer, when they are doing this at an act of worship, they are offering to demons, they are offering to spirits. So I don't want you to have fellowship, that same partnership, that same oneness, that spiritual oneness. You know, don't open your life for the influence, for the, you know, for coming to a place of oneness with the demons or the evil spirits. Okay. Now. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and gives us some more insight. What was it? You know, in Corinth, they would have what was typically called the table of, you know, and they would invite people, a okay, table of, let's say, some deity X, Y, Z, a okay, table of uh, Aphrodite or table of, uh, you are invited for the table of things. So what was that? It was actually a, a worship of that particular idol. And it would it would involve eating and drinking. It would involve food offered to idols. And he's talking about the worship ceremony, right? uh, which is called the table of, you know, so-and-so. Right? Table of, like we say, the table of the Lord is called the table of deity. Right? And uh, invitations would be sent, and people would get together and have this. And it will always, you know, it, and uh, most likely uh, to end in like a sexual immorality, which is also, again, considered an act of worship and so on. A lot of immoral things would happen at the end of it. Right? Now, he's, he's referring to that and he's saying that I do not want you to, you know, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and be part of that as well. You cannot eat, drink the cup of demons. You cannot uh, be, you know, you cannot drink uh, or uh, partake of the Lord's table and be part of that. So he's talking about the entire experience, the entire, you know, the the whole worship thing. That he's saying that don't be part of that. Don't open yourself for that, and don't I because I do not want you to have fellowship or you know any kind of oneness with the with the spirits okay uh, so that is uh, that is something that uh, he's very very clear and he's saying you know or do we provoke the lord to jealousy or are we stronger than he you know by doing this you are actually you know uh, provoking the lord right because we know that uh, you know there is 
there's only one you know he is god and by doing this it's again becoming an idol right you are taking part in this taking part in in this whole you know this worship on this table of demons taking part of the food uh, that is offered there and you're placing yourself in a very vulnerable position opening you know this is what communion is you know, it's fellowship is oneness uh, you're acknowledging and so the similar thing you're actually doing here so don't do it okay so that is the reason you know again we need to understand that's the reason why he is saying don't do it okay that is the table of demons that entire you know that that worship that's happening the food that is being offered and you know at the end of it you partaking of that the whole thing so you're saying i you cannot partake of the table of demons right then let's uh, read verses 23 onwards uh, all things are lawful for me and not all things are helpful all things are lawful but not all things edify uh, so let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Okay, so this is something, you know, this saying that now it all things are lawful for me. Okay, so he knows that, that the truth of the idol, the truth of food, everything, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I'm strong and uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Okay, so just because something is okay, okay, or culturally okay, traditionally okay, we need to ask the question, is it helpful? Does it edify? Okay, so that's what he's saying, right? All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things are edify. Okay, so ask yourself the question, is it helpful? Does it edify? Edify means does it build up? right is spiritually does it build me up is it helpful ask that question it could be okay for the majority right most of the people might not find anything wrong with it but is it helpful is it edify ask the question and verse 24 let no one seek his own but each one the other's well-being you know, seek the well-being of the other person and the context is again you know, with regard to this food and offered to idols and being part of it, you seek the other person's well-being, uh, which is what he says in chapter eight also. Right? Okay, so we'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll continue. Right.